Welcome to Subtext and Discourse, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the art world with the unique individuals involved in the field. I'm your host, Michael Dooney. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Angel Luis Gonzalez, who is one of the founding partners of Photo Island, which in 2010 became Ireland's first international festival for photography and image culture. Since that time, it has expanded to include The Library Project, a hub for visual culture and critical thinking, housed in Dublin's famous Temple Bar, How to Flatten a Mountain, a 12-day artist residency in collaboration with Cowhouse Studios, Half Tone, Dublin's annual print art fair celebrating printed matter in all its forms, and these are only a handful of the initiatives that have grown out of the festival. Angel contacted me prior to the 2020 edition of the Photo Island Festival to speak about their latest project, The Overjournal a new periodical publication and online platform that proposes its readers a more wholesome, honest, and critical observation and enjoyment of photography. You can subscribe to Subtext and Discourse in the Podbean app through the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most likely the streaming platform that you're listening to now. But without further delay, I hope you enjoy hearing my conversation with Angel Luis Gonzalez. I think, first of all, thanks for approaching me because you heard Peggy Sue Emerson's conversation, didn't you? I think it was the first one that I heard. Yeah. I just thought it was a hard to beat performance, I suppose, of our you know, interview. Like, it's, it's really, really energetic. It's really positive. When I listen to that, I feel like, yeah, come on, let's do it. And I just want to go, <laughs> go out and, and join her. I don't know. It's just, it's just great. I guess you must have known Peg before when she was still living in Ireland. Uh, yes, indeed. I met her very early on in the, when I was doing research for the festival. Mm-hmm. I can remember if I had been in Sirius Art Center before the festival to see some of the exhibitions that she may have programmed. But I did meet her and I, I tried to, well, I, I let her know about the festival and I tried to, to get her, her support. And uh, she joined some of the events in the first year of the festival. I think it was the portfolio reviews. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to to have, uh, you know, a uh, uh, much deeper relationship uh, then. But uh, but I think we were probably just too focused on, well, when I, when I say we, I mean uh, Moritz Niemüller and myself, who were kind of like the core team at the beginning. I don't know if you, you know who Moritz Niemüller is, but he's an independent curator based on Barcelona from Austria. And he had curated three editions of Photo España, uh, amongst other things. Actually, how I got to meet Moritz is kind of like a peculiar story because, and, I, and I, pff, where to start? Because I have to go back to when I graduated from college, that at some point, some friend from Switzerland sent me a text message saying, hey, would you like to move uh, to my apartment tomorrow? Uh, what? I mean, I'm really, <laughs> that would be what are you talking about? But I had visited them before in, in Zurich and I, I really liked the city and I liked the network of friends there. Everybody was super creative. It looked like a very interesting city. So what do you say? Well, you say yes. I said, uh, yes, but you know, um, let me just think about it uh, one more day. And I, the point is that I did. I did. I, I left everything uh, in 2008, I think it was. I went to to Zurich, and I was living there for just uh, over a, uh, just under a year, actually. Uh, during that time, going to the point of the story, we we go to all these parties, and in one of them, a photo editor from uh, London told me, "Oh, well, if you if you're thinking about starting a festival, you should talk to this guy." And she, in the middle of the party, grab her phone, uh, dial this number. And pull me on the phone with this guy. I don't know. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, who, uh, well, hi. That's how I met Moritz, basically, on a quick call from Zurich. I basically told him, look, I'm, I'm just trying to do this, fe- this festival. And uh, this crazy person just called you uh, and told me that we, we should speak. Anyway, so the point is that he, he thought that I was absolutely crazy. And that he was crazy enough to to be to wanting to do a, the, a festival. He, he was going to support me. And and so we, we worked a lot together since since then, since 2008. So, yeah, the core team of, of the festival. Uh, I mean, there was, there's always been many individuals around it, um, plenty of volunteers as well. But um, Moritz and myself, I think at the beginning we were, t- we were quite focused on, on developing a, a very particular type of festival. And that kind of maybe at some point didn't work with other people or we failed to kind of connect with other individuals. So you were in Barcelona then or you were already in Dublin? No, I was I was in Dublin. I was at that time I had been in Dublin for just over 10 years. Having finished my photography degree, there was like a year post where I was thinking, you know, should I leave, should I stay, should I go? 
I, I had um before I, I started the photography degree, I actually ran a design agency. So I kind of had a lot still happening in, in Dublin for me. But I was I mean my, my feeling was like there's no there, there wasn't much for any graduate in, in Ireland. There, there wasn't much happening, you know, it's what do you do? The 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 step from becoming a, a real life artist to exhibiting galleries or, or publish was massive. There was nothing there helping you uh, along the way, or at least nothing too evident. And I, I, I have the feeling that either I kind of like contribute to changing this or or I, I just kind of go somewhere, uh, I leave. But um, and I had the idea of the festival. Uh, I, I commented with, an, uh, with a tutor about this because I thought it was a, a nice model to to promote the, the discipline. So we have to account for the, the break that I had going to Zurich, which was kind of like going to the crossroads to, you know, to meet with the devil and <laughs> get your, your mojo or whatever. But I think it was, it was a very important uh, time as well, you know, to go to Zurich to reflect. While I was in Zurich, actually, I was flying literally every second week to back to Dublin to have conversations. I had plenty of conversations for over like a year and a half with all sorts of individuals, with artists, with curators, with uh, the Irish Museum of Modern Art director at the time. I tried to speak to literally everybody that I could. I went to talk to the Minister of Culture at the time. You know, I spoke with everybody. And uh, at some point, it just kind of like became real, you know, that, that I was going to do the festival. So I actually left Zurich, came back to Dublin just around 2009. And then there was a full year to prepare the festival and then launch it in July 2010. You ran a design agency yeah. for 10 years in Dublin before. What motivated the change? Well, sometimes you do stupid things, you know. I, <laughs> uh, completely irresponsible. No, I think uh, I always had a... Like you always had an interest in photography or the was something about it yeah I, you thought I, this is what i really want to do i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say i, I always had an interest in specifically in photography but I, I have somehow an interest in in, in the arts and uh I mean, growing up, I always draw, I painted. I remember designing book covers even before I knew what I was doing, you know, even before a teenager, I just was designing book covers. What am, what am I doing? I'm just coming up with a with a story and, this, and a design. And what is this book? I have no idea. I don't even need to write it because I have the cover. The reason perhaps that I, I was not practicing as a photographer in, while I was in, in living in Madrid, it was maybe a lack of uh, resources. You know, I, I after my high school, I went to study journalism, but I was more into the writing aspects uh, and I work for a... Um, a news agency until I got tired and burned of the rubbish news about politics and noticing that, you know, whatever I researched, nobody was going to publish. So I decided to quit journalism and move to Ireland looking for opportunities. How did you pick Ireland? Uh, I, I think it was uh, influenced by my sister. She had been in Ireland studying English before um, and she's kind of like got a sense that, you know, the, the economy here was okay at the time, 97, 98, mm -hmm. sort of like the slow beginning of, of some sort of boom. A lot of European money going in as well. So so I thought, okay, well, you know, let's try. I mean, I just needed to get out of, of Madrid. It was really hard to get a job in Madrid at the time. Uh, I mean, never mind now. But, you know, I think throughout that period, like my, my artistic output was mostly like the paintings that I did or, or, or whatever. I never I never had, I think, enough uh, resources to, to go into photography or to think about the develop, developing some sort of artistic career. So when I was in Dublin, quickly realized that there was a great opportunity through the unemployment office to study very decent courses, new media, creative design for magical words, you know, new media, creative design, you know, give it to me. And all these type of uh, computer courses. So I, I did a, a number of them and eventually decided to start the um, design agency with a co colleague, Spanish, Pablo. And together we came up with this name, Cuomo, Q-U-O-M-O. I have no idea what it meant, but that was our company. And we had a number of, of clients that, that some of them I still keep. And it was more a process of learning, not only design, because we had a very basic understanding of design, but also like marketing, SEO, the business side, invoicing, you know, everything. It was a, it was a very interesting time. And that started to give me a little bit more of a safety net. That's why perhaps I, I then started to do other things. One of the complaints that Pablo used to have uh, about me is that I was always doing something else. So, okay, we had a company, but then I, started, I decided to do a, a radio program here in a pirate radio called Jazz FM because I wanted to listen to the music that I used to listen to in Spain, which it may be Spanish music, but it was not, it's not flamenco. You know, there's a, a wide variety, you know, from jazz to, to funk and more 
And so I wanted to, to, to have that in Ireland and I couldn't. At the time, podcast services, I mean, the internet was almost starting. So there was a sense that you would not be able to, to access this type of uh, documents, not even in the national radio. We have a really cool station, the Radio 3, which I don't know if you can approximate to Radio 4 in the BBC, but essentially that's where you learn about music. You know, it's, it's not about listening to Radio Formula. This is about somebody telling you the whole story of Bob Dylan. It's like, wow, you know, after one hour, you're absolutely thrilled about that, that program. So anyway, the point, he was always his comment that I jump into doing these things. And, and it was a really interesting program. You know, it was a Sunday evening. So it was sort of like the last thing on the weekend. And I had a chance to to play whatever I wanted and until they eventually closed the, the station. Because, yeah, it was a pirate station. <laughs> but yeah, so we'll keep working with the agency. And there was always something happening around because I was excited by many other disciplines, you know. And I, I remember I did a part-time course in the University of Photography. And I just thought like, you know, this is there's something here for me. There's something quite interesting that I need to investigate and then I went on to do the BA and through the BA I realized actually the creative aspect of image making is, is very interesting, but actually the critical theory side and, you know, the, the reflection on the work seems to be even, even more attractive. We were lucky in, a, in our program that we had very good tutors on, on that side of things. Uh, yeah, I think that corrupted me in the, in the right direction. Nice. But then when you're talking about the agency, and that was obviously quite a steep learning curve because you had to not only learn about design, but you had to learn about marketing and promotion. Had you been involved in other festivals before? Had you participated in festivals and thought, I could really do this? Or this is something I would like to to make happen? Not really. No, I don't think I... I mean, I've been in different collectives in, in Madrid, but never running something at this level and... You know, like I'm a, I'm a very shy person, despite what people may think. I am a really, really shy person, perhaps an introvert. But if you give me the right space, you know, or if I'm talking about something that I am passionate about, I will deliver or I try to anyway. And I think the me going around and meeting all these people was to gain a sense of, okay, what, what is it that everybody is looking for? Or, you know, what is their feedback? What is it that we are missing? Where do I sit in this context? You know, what do I need to uh, to do? And um, and I think that sort of research can give you a little bit more of comfort zone where where you can start to to play and maybe bring in with you some alliances, you know, some collaborations. And I think that that helped a lot. That was a massive uh, uh, massive learn, learning curve. I mean, I was going around town with uh, two A fours, stating what I wanted to do. And I managed to, to meet the, the director of the, the Modern Art Museum here. I don't think I would, that will have happened in Madrid. You know? <laughs> there, there's something about Ireland, perhaps, you know, because of the size. I don't know. Or maybe they, they were really, really extremely keen. But in any case, I think there was there was a sense that maybe this was something that was meant to to happen, you know, that, that the time had come. By the way, I'm, I am aware that in, in uh, 2005, there was an, a sort of like a research done. And I think Peggy Swamison was, was involved in this in Cork mm-hmm. to develop a photography festival. And I, I managed to get the, the research document that uh, uh, contains all the, all the information. So you get a sense that, you know, there was a lot of work already being done then in, sort of in the background mm-hmm. because there was an interest, because there is a gap, because there is a need in the market, perhaps. Because did Belfast Photo Festival already exist at that time? No, Belfast Photo Festival arrived, I don't know if it was 2010 or 2011. I did spoke with Michael when I was setting up my own festival or, or even in, in the first editions as he was looking for feedback and ideas. I think once the, the Photograph Festival was launched, it was kind of like a, a sense of, of uh, okay, well, you know, Maybe I can do a festival too. Yeah. I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but there was a sense that, you know, why not do it? And so has happened, you know, over the years, there were a couple of attempts to develop some other festivals. And I would say like, you know, one of the best things that can happen to us is that somebody comes and develops this huge, amazing photography festival so I can stop doing it. <laughs> so please, really, I mean, I don't know, people think that competition is not welcome. I am dying to have competitions so we can focus on, on other things as well. I can imagine it's a hell of a lot of work to bring everything together. Because do you have a big team? No, I mean, what the team usually is that one or two individuals as the core, you know, uh, Moritz was from the very beginning, the curator, at least for the three, four first editions. And then uh, I started to develop my own curatorial skills in, in a very particular direction. And he acted more as an advisor core team. So we were lucky at the beginning. We work with uh, individuals like Claudine Neer, who also graduated from a BA in, in Dublin. And, uh, you know, just like perfectionist, hard worker, super focused. I think somehow over the years, the people that, that we attracted were also as passionate as we were, you know. And you have to be passionate because most of our work is unpaid. Uh, at least in the in the first years, either you had the passion or, or what? I think even like you were saying, when you said about Ireland being small and that there was an interest there, 
I think as well, my experience when you go off into smaller places, because there isn't much to choose from, the people that are engaged and really want to do something are really passionate about it because they know if they don't do it, it's not going to happen. Whereas if I compare it sometimes to Berlin, because there are so many things on offer, you get a bit spoiled and you don't say, oh, well, if this doesn't happen, then I can just go to something else instead. But when you're from a smaller place, I know comparing it to when I lived in Perth, which is really isolated, if something isn't taking place or if there's an event that's happening and you don't go to it or the response isn't there, then they won't have another one because they'll think there's not enough interest, so there's no point. So the people that are really passionate and get behind these projects really are dedicated to it just because they know if we don't support this and we don't keep this going, it'll be gone and then we'll have nothing. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, all you need is one person that is passionate beside you. That's it. You know, I'd rather have that than 30 that are not. How was it at the beginning? Like, how was the initial response? Because maybe you touch a bit on this in the journal, in your editor's article, but I guess when you were approaching other organizations and things like that, you're not Irish. I know myself not being German or not being European, trying to do something. It's a bit of, who's this guy? What's he doing? How was it when you very first started out? Well, who's this guy from Spain that wants to do a photography festival in Ireland? I never felt unwelcome, you know, at least, which is is good. Perhaps, you know, as I, as I think I've been told a couple of times, perhaps the fact that I wasn't Irish somehow helped, you know, I, I don't know to, to what degree. But I know, I think, I mean, in general, the, the response have been from the beginning, you know, has been quite positive from, from many indiv- individuals and organizations. And, and if anything, what I, what I touched upon in the, the editor's note of, uh, of our journal is more geared towards certain organizations that you, you will have expected that they will be supportive, but but somehow there was always a sort of obstruction, you know, and I, li- I like that word obstruction because it reminds me of the five obstructions by Lash, Lash Montier, this idea of ha- having to work. Okay, now you're going to have this, this obstruction and now you have to work with this. Okay, fine. You know, like I've learned to work with obstructions. This hasn't been a problem. But the thing is that over the years, reflecting, you know, now we have this, this wealth of data in, in our heads and in, and, and in written where we can look back and kind of like look at what happened and sort of reflecting. I and mean, this happened only uh, recently. I kind of realized that uh, there was a bit of what I would say is gaslighting. Perhaps even the fact that that, that I only realize now is even more, more evidence that it is gaslighting. It took me such a long time to realize that actually there is a constant erosion, you know, of, of what you're what you're trying to do uh, and a negativity aimed towards you. I always put this example of the this there is a Spanish say, you see, and it says that the dog of the farmer he doesn't eat and he doesn't let you eat. And that was the situation, you know, in, in some cases. So not only I'm not going to cooperate, but actually I'm going to try to make your your life hard. Look, life is uh, far more interesting than that. And I think what we realized is that, you know, we just have to keep working with organizations and individuals that we admire and, and keep going. But I think there is a sense that this is something that may happen and does happen to, to many individuals and organizations in Ireland and abroad. So I think through over, we will, we'll try to figure out a, a way in which we can kind of create uh, what jokingly I call sort of like a customer service office or a, com- <laughs> or a complaints office rather. Yeah. So we could actually gather some sort of, okay, what's happening? You know, you know who's, who's, who's like gaslighting you or who's uh, bullying you or who's, uh, who's like uh, really acting the maggot. I don't know how that's going to materialize. And um, perhaps we can, we can talk about later when we talk about over, but uh, there is going to be a, a, an online element of over journal that is going to be a bit more combatant, but in, in our way, you know? Yeah. I mean, we can start talking about the journal now, if you like, and then just jump back to the f- aspects of the festival, because I feel like the over journal feels like a product of everything that you've been doing over the last 10 years. So a lot of different projects and aspects of the festival have kind of fed into this book that was almost inevitable, it seems. Well, we, we took the opportunity, as, I suppose, that, that over presented this time to advance some of the program from the festival. You see, like we did the fundraise earlier this year. That was the Patreon. Uh, no, this was uh, through Indiegogo. So the Indiegogo campaign was uh, around February, March. And uh, fairly quickly, we ran into a, a lockdown. So we thought, okay, well, we, we're going to have to postpone over journal until October. You know, we, we need a lot of time for everybody to to contribute and whatnot. And meanwhile, we started to work on, on the festival. And then the festival had to deal with the lockdown. We, we went through like five different iterations of the festival. This year, the festival, it was going to be just as interesting because we were not going to focus on galleries. Uh, we were actually going to deliver all the content or most of the content through a stage. So in a theater context and uh, in a performative way. Uh, how? I have no idea, but we were going to do it. We had a number of um, acts, if you want to call it, already programmed. Some of them, the kind of materialized, converted into, into online delivery. Some of them had to be canceled. But dealing through those iterations, we realized 
we are focusing a lot on the online as the only place to, to deliver content. Even before Corona, you were already thinking a lot about online. No, we were thinking about performance, but you see that when, when we had to do to do this switch from having hosting a, a physical event to try to come up with uh, solutions, online was a direct solution. No, I mean I, we already um, I think early even even during late March you can start you could start already to see things happening online, whether it was Zoom or some other. So that was like a very straightforward solution. Again, you know how we don't know. But we know that that's going to happen online. But some other content, particularly very specific exhibitions, could not happen online. And we did not want to to set up a, a website where you can go through different rooms and look at work. That's so hard to make properly, you know, that's in a way that it doesn't look like Doom, yeah. a, a, one from the 90, <laughs> a, a game from the 90s. I think at some point we came to the conclusion that actually the potential of over was significant to give us the, the solution in this case. So then we, it was a matter of adapting uh, some of the content and fi- figuring out what makes sense to to add to the to the journal and what can be left for for future editions of the of the festival. Mm. Was that part of the reason you made it a physical publication rather than just an online or a digital offering? No, I mean, the, the journal was already planned and there was already the Indiegogo campaign, you know, so like that was going to happen, but it was going to happen late, later in the year. So we thought that if we bring it forward and we actually start to work on it through uh, late March, we can actually achieve to publish it on time for July. And there was a lot of work to actually make the festival and the journal happen at the same time. Uh, that worked really well. But the whole idea of over... I mean, I was just looking at some of the previous designs, even just of the kind of world over in a, in a cover. And that was from uh, 2008. So, that, you know, the, there is a history of kind of like a transition to what has materialized. And even even that cover of 2008, as, as I mentioned in the, at the launch of the journal during the festival, there was an intention in 2010 of uh, producing a magazine that at the time I called IB, image based. But this, this was more focused on portfolio as opposed to, you know, kind of like a phone magazine type of publication. I did show at the launch the picture of the cover cover of image based. And you can see one of the images from the project by Nao Charai, the South African artist with a project that is called The Black President. A very interesting project. From 2010, the, the, slowly that was in the back of our heads. And, and, and I think over time it kind of materialized into, OK, first of all, is we don't need a, another portfolio magazine or journal. But we need something a bit more, more specific and then kind of like teasing out the shape of this and what kind of content we would like to have if, uh, if there was a new Irish magazine. So it has been a, a very long process. Sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this happens to you as well. You know, you have projects that they may be on the work bench, you know, f- for quite a while until they, they, they just find their fit for purpose and they find their space. I think it has been quite a nice organic way for over to arrive. We have pushed some other projects in the past into reality. And sometimes that, that felt, uh, I don't know, pre premature. Yeah, exactly. And I think this one was, uh, it was the right moment. I quite like the structure of the magazine. And as you're saying, the we have enough portfolio publications dedicated to photography. And I like with this one that it's almost as though the first half of it is critical writing on photography. And then the second half of it is looking at specific bodies of work and specific artists. Was that always the plan that you would do half and half? Because it's almost, I don't like using the word curated for everything, but it feels very well curated. Well, you can say it's very well edited, but I, I, <laughs> I feel to answer quickly that sort of separation between text and the more visual content was something that we did in 2011 when we published a book with Martin Parr on the, the best books of the decade at the time. So he was looking back to 2000 to 2010 and in conversation with the designer, we figured out that it would be great to have a sort of separation. So there is a cer- certain content that can actually alter quite a lot the layout. And when you start and stop as somebody through a magazine reading, you know, you know, you know, it can be quite counterproductive. But we felt like if there was an area where you can sit down and read and then there is a, a separate area where can, you can actually browse, that would be great. And the beginning of the of the magazine, if you press down a little bit the pages, it's actually a really nice space to start to read. It just feels, you know, with your right with your right hand, you're holding the magazine, and it just feels comfortable as it is. If you have all the block of uh, pages on the left hand side, it, it will feel a little bit like the book is trying to close itself, and you want to um, move things quickly. Anyway, so I think that, that was the critical reasoning behind the, that separation. But but in essence, the purpose of the of the journal was to have this duality of becoming part magazine in the sense that, you know, it may align with the portfolio type of magazine and part journal. The idea is that it's going to deliver content that is more academic and eventually including papers. 
one of the last pages of the journal advances that, that there's going to be a call for papers, for articles and for work. And we are working on that now. Daniel Wetker smith who you may know from the Asia Pacific Photobook Archive, he's been quite supportive in the process of making uh, our journal. And I've commented with him this idea of uh, creating this space where actually papers can be published. You know, when you, when you publish a, a paper, no matter how interesting it is, uh, most likely it's going to be read by 100 people. If we identify those that may be key for our practice, perhaps we can actually publish them. So we're writing that now the actual call. The call is quite complex because it's divided in three parts. The call for papers and you, you have to figure out how that's going to develop. It's going to be a peer review panel. So we're trying to figure out how, who in, indeed is going to be reviewing this. And we are, we don't want to get like individuals or rather we want to get individuals from all around the world, all from all continents or as many as possible. And that's what we're doing right now. But also like, you know, we have to figure out how to distribute the papers and so on. But that's just administration. And the call for articles includes also a call for interviews. In, in a sense, it's kind of an open call for proposals. So you can actually write to us and say, listen, I, I'm actually going to write about this subject and I think it's quite interesting. So, okay, so this is how you do submit. Follow these steps and we will... Uh, oh, so like you would for a newspaper or for a magazine, that you send them a pitch and then say, would you commission this? Yeah, precisely, yes. And we will pay for it as well. And whenever we give the green light, the individual will have a period of time to produce that, that article or interview. And then the call for works, which is a kind of like standard call for works. But again, if we select some work, we will also pay pay for that. And um, it, it is a very complex uh, call, so we want to make sure that we have it right from, from the beginning. This relates also to the fact that while we have a, a printed version, we are looking at the online platform as an active uh, space. And perhaps it's, it's hinted by Anna Einstein's text in our journal. If you... Yeah, I like how she presented it. I watched the presentation at the beginning of the festival, but even that you've translated, in a sense, the kind of Instagram aesthetic and way of presenting and then put it onto a hard copy in the book. Yeah. I mean, she's a, she's a brilliant artist and, we, and a brilliant mind as well. She can tell you with the most wonderful smile, very, very important issues. We follow her practice for, for, for a while and she also was exhibiting in Photo Island as well. And that's something that I like that, uh, you know, following her on Instagram is how she uses Instagram as a space for critical discourse. Because I think that that is, the, that is where the battleground is, you know. For me, the battleground is not me on a Sunday afternoon looking at a, a newspaper, looking at an advert of a Volvo car, cutting out this advert and then writing an essay about how this uh, advert talks about sexuality. You know, that belongs to a particular time. I think now that is happening elsewhere. And precisely for that, I believe that having this in the way that it has been presented in the magazine, sort of like borrowing from the Instagram vocabulary, it, it was key. I'm actually trying to see, you know, uh, ways in, um, to continue with this with this process with her. The way she delivered the performance during the launch, uh, I think it was it was fantastic. It was uh, uh, super interesting, you know, talking, sitting down in a chair, talking to a booth, while in the background there is a, a virtual tour of the National Gallery of Ireland, talking about the colonizing uh, Lensbury practices. Uh, in, in you know, well, there's like rooms filled with uh, all sorts of paintings, many of them relating to colonial times. If anything, I'm pretty sure that the, the National Gallery of Ireland building it was built in the 1700s, most likely, because that's where Dowling was quite wealthy. And all that money was coming from the merchants and most likely for the colonies. So, you know, it is, it is kind of like a very pertinent context. We never told her to do that. She did it. When it was her choice. And I think it was brilliant. She sits in the, in the magazine in this kind of like a transition between the text and the, and the most visual part. That's where I think there is a lot of very interesting things happening that we can actually bring to the online conversation. So we, we're going to experiment in short. The online presence is going to provide once a month some sort of content, maybe tweet length, or it may be a, a little video from Instagram, or it may be a long form essay. We don't know because this is something that we don't want to prescribe. But I think that the, between uh, all the co uh, contributors and Julia and myself, we will devise ways to to present this. And, you know, perhaps the, the complaints office will be also open and kind of like gathering materials and we'll figure out what to do with those materials if, if they come. But I think having allowing also for that kind of open in a conversation about everything that surrounds the arts is important. That duality then between the annual publication and the monthly delivery of content through overjournal.org, that's kind of like the, the core activities of this journal. Meanwhile, you know, there will be a call twice a year, every six months. I'm hoping as well that, you know, we will, we will give the chance 
to writers and artists and curators and thinkers to share their minds with us. Yeah, I hope so. And I think even for people that are maybe in one of the different camps, so less so in the critical practice side of things, but more just in terms of making images and producing photography. Because I know for me, when I was more active as a photographer and producing my own projects, I did get to a point where I couldn't get any further. And it wasn't until I started reading critical texts about photography that it really broadened my horizons and opened my perspective to new things. And it was the book, The Photography Reader, which was edited by Liz Wells, which has a good collection of essays, which covers many different aspects of the historical point of view of photography, but then also how it's evolved and then the different ways, or not just the way that photographers have used photography, but also regular people or artists that have just picked it up and used it as a tool rather than thinking, I'm going to be a photographer. It's just, this helps me achieve what I've set out to achieve combining that I think with the book is a really great idea because hopefully then for other people that maybe haven't necessarily been exposed to that kind of content up until that point can realize there are other things that I can do with photography and there's a more of an avenue for taking it to a different place. You just cannot have one without the other, you know. So that's why we thought that this is the way we have to present it. I think it is it is great. I mean, as you can see, some of the texts that, that, that are in this first issue, how relevant and how incisive they are. Some others may be a bit more suggestive and um, I'm just uh, a looking at, for example, at Gloria Oyarzabal, uh, where she's kind of uh, sharing her uh, considerations for, for your practice. And there is very, very serious set of questions and, and propositions on how to underpin your practice in a way that answers some key questions around race, gender, about appropriation, and, and so on. It's barely two pages, but it's jam-packed, you know, with uh, things to, to reflect up, uh, upon your practice. How did you select all the different contributors to put it together? Because just as a quick side note, I remember watching Anna Ehrenstein's presentation and then even reading Gloria's article about it. They do frame the questions in a way that does cause you to take a step back and really think about it. It's not in a you should be doing this because you have a privilege and this is the way that you should be approaching it. It is very much in a, how am I trying to say this, in a more objective and outside view of looking at it. It's like, don't think of it from the position that you're in, but just let's step away from the situation, have a look at it from the outside and think about this. When you're talking about art history, you're talking about Western art history. You're not talking about art in these other parts of the world. And when you consider access to certain facilities and structures, they're already in place that serves a very limited demographic. You need to be cognizant of whether or not you're part of that or if you're not part of that, and then how that plays into your way of existing. Well, I mean, maybe it's just me, but when I listened to the presentation and read the different articles in the journal, it wasn't accusatory. It was, no, think about it. These are things that we need to think, like that everybody, all of us need to think about this with anything that we're doing, the position that we're in and how it's going to be received. Gloria and Anna, they're just two super bright minds. And I think they took the challenge. I mean, they delivered something that we are super happy with. It's... um. It's, it's in, in their experience as well. Gloria is talking from a position where she already have gone through this. She's been living in uh, in Mali. She's been working about Africa, that country called Africa, for many years. And um, and I think Anna is uh, constantly talking about this idea about cultural appropriation and, and, you know, all these issues that I think they are really, really well placed to discuss them. And we have seen how they have done so in the past. So it's not like we were taking a risk. I mean, we, we trust uh, them. But in relation to, you know, the, the, the content, I think the, there is a limitation, I suppose, to what you can include in a magazine, you know, just you know, in a practical sense. But was it an open call initially? Oh, no, Because I know no. we, you were saying before about how you put it together. These feel like they were invited, like you yeah. had very specific ideas of who you wanted to include and the kind of content you wanted them to contribute. Yeah, because for for the first issue, we wanted to show what we're kind of aiming at, you know, so it's probably easier to do it that way. I mean, we're very conscious about putting voices from, again, you know, from all continents and from all sides of the spectrum in whatever category you want to think. But we're also very conscious and you know of course we have a number of individuals writing that uh, uh, that pretty much write for for many other magazines but the, the the sense is that we wanted to start from a point where we present our ideal selection of text and it is looking at quite specific issues that affect how we we understand the practice uh, you were talking about this idea of talking about something without being perhaps contentious no contentious no more like a, what would be the word combatant maybe perhaps yeah well being divisive and coming up with this really us and them you have to do this if you want to be included so that's why for example in terms of uh, 
two first texts are about criticism. That's our answer to other things that have happened around us, where we, we actually need to understand why exactly are we accepting criticism? What is it for what, as a tool, you know, to learn? And I think because, you know, it, again, you know, with this idea of uh, of the misuse or, or let me see if I can phrase this in a way that it makes more sense and is, is more fluid. When we propose these two texts about criticism, what we're trying to identify or to highlight is what we feel is the right context and the right issues that are around criticism, you know. I think George Corbett with a quite succinct text highlights already a number of problems. And then Duncan completely kills it going into some detail, the many aspects that may affect criticism. Why is important criticism? And why we, we talk about criticism? Well, you know, your your exhibition, your text, your event, your book is going to be most likely presented somewhere and somebody's going to write about about it. And we feel that, you know, in, in some cases, there has been a, a lot of bullying, you know, through this monodirectional power where somebody can actually write about you and say whatever they want on their own platform. And that's it. Obviously, that's not going to happen on, on Twitter or uh, on social media, but, you know, on their own platform, because that's where they set their rules and you're not supposed to engage with them. And when you do, there is no reply because, you know, it's almost like a, a kid throwing a stone. So my response to to that sense of uh, kids throwing stones is to say, okay, let's let's, have, let's talk about throwing stones. How do you work around criticism? Because uh, I think we sometimes it's nice to kind of, to go back and to reflect on the, the root of the problem and f- figuring out how can we take this and, and move on. But likewise, you know, we there are some other texts that provides an insight of our, our interests in um, around photography, you know, there's two texts also around museums and photography. One by somebody had, that has been working for, for a museum for quite a long time, and the other one by a curator who was, has been working on photography and is reflecting on, on this idea of on, on devising a, a museum for photography. And I think they are super different views. They may clash in the edges, but I think they are actually quite complementary. Showing a space where actually you can see that certain ideas may not necessarily be aiming at the, at the same direction, but actually some may be focused on more particular aspects of museology, and the other one is talking about theoretical aspects around museology. These are both a very, very interesting conversations. Yeah, well, I remember from when I read them yesterday, even going through the ones about criticism, the ones about museums, and then moving into specific bodies of work by photographers, they all complement one another. I think what was interesting actually going through them is the way that they address photography as one thing. I wonder if this is some of the reason why, because I think Jörg touches on it in his article, why photography has so many difficulties sometimes, because it's just seen as that's photography and it's all in one container. Whereas you don't ever talk about painting like that. You talk about different movements and different periods. Whereas photography is just, these are things that are made with the camera and then that's it. There's very little subcategorization unless you're going into like photo land, as he called it, and you're specifically at a photography museum or a photography gallery. It's always somehow parallel to the rest of contemporary art for some reason. I mean, the, the word photography means so many things for so, so many different people that it's actually dangerous. I mean, I don't blame Wim Benders for trying to find a, a new word to define this, this thing, you know. I think in the end, what we tend to call photography it is, it is around the, uh, devising some sort of visual narratives with uh, with images. But, you know, even this definition may bring you to question like, uh, okay, but, you know, how, how are these images made? Are these made by a bot? Like, for example, uh, as it was uh, yesterday's case with uh, the screen walks that uh, the Photo Museum of Winterthur and the Photographer's Gallery organized, they had a bot going through Google Street View taking pictures, you know, there is a street photographer. What is fascinating is, is all these complexities in, uh, around photography. You know, Alan Butler, Irish artist, going inside Grand Theft Auto and becoming a photographer, taking pictures of prostitutes and homeless, and kind of like reconsidering the representation of reality within a, a video game. You know, a video game that is supposed to be real, so it's made to be real. It shows faces of people that were real. These things are very interesting, and all these practices around representation are terribly interesting. Whether we call them photography or or something else, in the end, is many photographers are actually visual artists whether they like it or not. And still, there are many photographers that like to be photographers and that's what they would call themselves. And that is perfectly fine too. So I think, you know, perhaps, you know, as I was maybe mentioning with the text, uh, as well, that there is room for flexibility. You know, there is a, <laughs> there has to be a diversity of um, opinions and uh, of modes of being, and that is perfectly fine. It's not just my way of viewing something or nothing else. Well, I think when you were talking about criticism and even in the book, rather than just focusing on criticism to point out what's bad with something, it's really more criticism to 
to engage in dialogue and to have a discussion about something and to say why something's good or bad or why you feel the way you do about something and then take on other points of view and understand that from other people's perceptions rather than just saying this is okay and this is not okay. It should be an exchange rather than just as you say, like a one way it's published and that's it. You can't refute that. I mean, yeah, it's published, but it's also like, um, I mean, I I can give you an example. Okay. I'm only going to bring this up because I think it's informative. Duncan Woolbridge touches uh, on it. There's a a magazine in Ireland that wrote a a review about last year's edition of the Photo Ireland Festival. It was the 10th edition. It ran for three months, not just one, but actually three, you know, fantastic. It had two cores of activities, one in May and the other one in July. So clearly during June, there wasn't going to uh, much happening. And we had this individual individual coming to our shop in Dublin and the library project and asking in, uh, what is the festival in a very upset mood okay well you know, here's the catalog you know you actually chose a, a day that is particularly bad because as you can see in the calendar there is not much happening but you know you can go and see this this and that and this person left and then came back with a fairly negative attitude you know talking to us about the fact that there, there was no many many exhibitions on what can we do it's like uh, before you uh, go to the festival you have to read the the schedule or the the timetable we offer the timetable online you can download a pdf it's on facebook you can see it in isu jesus christ it's like everywhere you know it's not like we make it hard but then actually it turns out that this person was there to write a review of the festival and we thought like wow how is he going to write a review of the festival is going to, what is he going to write she, she, has, she hasn't seen anything she hasn't been here in may and she's not going to be here in july she chose the the worst day to come to the festival so she wrote a, a, a review and the review was um, kind of like a facebook rant about the fact that i went to the f- uh, festival I, there was an exhibition in the show just uh, around the books then there was not much to see and uh, you know what a waste of time and I mean, that's not really criticism. This was published in a, in a, in a magazine that was, was supposed to have some sort of respect for itself. And um, for, for us, it really felt like kind of like a very, not even unfair, but kind of like a purposely malicious selection of information to, to represent us. Mm-hmm. I've noticed with a few different newspapers as well and other online publications that a lot of it is less criticism and more opinion pieces. People are just venting their experience and whatever mood they were in that day, that's what they're writing their article about. There's no self-reflection or why was it like this or I looked into it or this looked really good. And even to turn up in the middle when it was quiet and to say, I obviously picked the wrong time to come because in May all of this happened, in June all of this happened, or in July all of this happened, but I was here in June, so everything was closed. It was really unfortunate, but this looks good, this looks good. Just to say, this was so frustrating. I don't know why they did this. This is not a very good festival. It says more about that person than it does about the festival, but that seems to be what we're used to hearing now. And I mean, if you think about, it also speaks about the, the editors that are allowed this to go in print, because this is not like a, something that somebody clicked and, pu- and it was published. This was actually designed and placed into a, a, a magazine. Yeah, somebody had to approve it. <laughs> Imagine. So my view around this is, is that, okay, this person who turned out to be somebody that graduated from Berkeley and has plenty of research behind her, decided to write this text about us. And then this journal or this magazine rather decided to actually publish. This is a, a conscious decision of, I am going to publish this text. Now, I actually, I, I contacted both of them by email um, and, and by letter saying like, okay, you know, fair, fair enough. Thanks for your review. But let's pick up the conversation. I want to have a a further conversation uh, with you about this. You know, I want to find out how many times you go to festivals, you know, what other things have you seen and, you know, what is it, how come you arrive to this kind of issue? Because it's it's, it's still important for me. But there was no reply because this, uh, in this sense, you know, this is this idea of uh, this child attitude of like, I am far too high to have a conversation with you or something like this. What's the context of this? You know, how can, how can somebody publish something like this? And if you, by the way, pass the page forward or backward in that magazine, you will see a normal review of other events. So it's, it kind of like stands out. So I think it, all the readers will, will be very aware of what's happening there. But this, this is a magazine that has not review our festival ever. Oh, really? Okay. And it's also a magazine that when I started the festival, and perhaps with this little anecdote, I finished talking about this magazine. I was in, on rehearsals for a, a performance that I was going to do for a Theatre Finch festival where that it was going to merge photography and performance. And uh, I got this call from uh, the editor and it's 
start to to ask me, this is in 2010 or even late 2009, ask me about the, the, the program for the festival. And I, as, as I always do, a super straightforward, give you all information, you know, we're trying to do this, we're trying to do that. This is the the main photographers. But, I, you know, please don't don't mention this in particular because I'm not sure if it's going to happen. And then this person turned around and, and commented like, oh, I'm, I'm a journalist, you know, I, I can publish whatever I want. Okay, yeah, fair, fair enough, you know, that's fine. So I was looking forward to see some sort of review on the on the magazine about the festival and what it came out finally printed was a one-liner on the left side of uh, the page almost like beyond uh, a column so kind of like a random uh, corner saying that uh, there is going to be a new photography festival in Ireland called Photo Ireland and the director was very coy about the program <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, th this is the level of criticism that we have when it comes to certain things that you don't like. I mean, how can I understand this reasoning, you know? I think it's good to move on from this type of attitudes and trying to be positive and constructive. So these are issues that are answer, uh, answered by George Colbert and Duncan Woolbridge. And, and from then on, we can move on and look into the more constructive and productive futures, you know? Yeah. Well, then I guess from a more positive angle, how was the festival received this year? Compared to the previous years, this is predominantly digital. And so you don't have the same community aspect of people going to a festival and engaging and things like that. It largely took place online. So you had a few live streams. There were also videos that were available to watch. They're still on the 2020 Photo Island website now. What was the feedback in general? Or how did you feel that it went? Actually, the feedback is, is hard to, to grasp with online events. We have had, of course, a lot of people that came forward to tell us that they enjoyed many of the performances and the live broadcasts. And I think things like the screen walks that already had a followership, they were enjoyed. I, we were very lucky that we had Conor McGarrigal delivering one of the screen walks and uh, the collaboration with Photos Museum of Winter Tour. Again, you know, I think that they also somehow have their own followership. But I think in general, they were very well received. There were some, some technical issues. I think I remember in the launch. We still have that limit in Zoom where we couldn't have more than 100 guests, which was was very stupid. Oh, but really? It was, it was an, uh, yeah, it was an issue with um, the license. So. No, I didn't know this was Zoom, that you had a restriction on the number of people. Because when I saw the numbers, I thought, wow, this is really good. You've got a lot of people tuned in. No, there were like another 100 something waiting, you know, because judging by the by the bookings, the license that we have bought was not activated in the right account, basically. Something, you know, technical that we didn't know. Because, yeah, in the end, this has been quite a, quite a massive uh, learning curve. So that technical issue prevented a number of people from joining the launch but there was around 200 220 230 people and in the end we, we just got a hundred and some sort of rotation of people coming in and out at some point but i think the performance thankfully is recorded and it's available so that's good and then people enjoyed as well the launch of over journal with heather's conversation with Aidan kelly yeah she was really good that was fantastic so and again you know it's, it's still available online so that's pretty good and to the technical aspect you know to deliver the live feed through twitch for both situations that was a nice I think I remember some people telling me live, like, there is no sound oh, really? from, uh, I think that was in, in, in the case of uh, Mario Santa Maria. So the Twitch broadcast didn't work out very well at the beginning. But I mean, these things can, can become very complex between a... Uh, we were using OBS, which is kind of like a video editor for live feeds, delivering through uh, Zoom and some videos from BLC Player and then rerouting sound through loopback. Geraldine was super helpful, Geraldine Kouarev. Uh, we spent a good four hours setting up the sound so there was no echoes. Wow, you know, just kind of like breaking our heads and to figure out things. So now this is something that we know and, uh, and we will use in the future. We definitely want to broadcast live uh, many of the events that are coming up and uh, we'll figure out how, how ways, uh, you know, many ways to, to use this for over as well. I think it's going to be very interesting to, to do so. You'll incorporate a lot of this as standard practice now going forward. Yeah, completely, completely. It is a very interesting format. The fact that you can deliver, I mean, if you go to Twitch right now, you'll see lots of gamers. That's why I was always confused by Twitch when people said they were using it. And whenever I've gone to it, it's just people playing games. <laughs> big, <so>. big. <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly because it's a very stable platform. So like it actually works and you don't have issues maybe like in Facebook or, or in YouTube. And the sound is, is quite clear and the, and the video quality is quite good. We can kind of learn from them and uh, take advantage of that uh, live delivery. There is something very interesting about this, this idea. So yeah, we'll, we'll work on that for sure. And you're thinking of doing it for the journal as well? Because you have a number of different projects that you have parallel. The Critical Academy, the Temple Bar, 
Now you've got Overjournal, the festival. I suppose you've got other things that happen throughout the year. And then the festival is just during the summer, I assume. So the organization that we call Photo Ireland runs events of which we have the Photo Ireland Festival that is between May and July. It can it can change, but for the next five years, it's going to be July. We also have another event called Halfton. It's a print fair that we run in November in our venue in the library project. The purpose of the fair is to bring together all disciplines into an appreciation of the printed matter as the artwork. So that means that photography is presented alongside all other printed techniques or, or, or approaches like, you know, from lithography to screen printing and whatnot. So I think in, in Ireland, there is a, a great appreciation of all the other approaches, but photography perhaps not that much. So that was the Halfton was addressing. And it's actually a place where we, um, Halfton dresses the library project with over 200 works. So it's a saloon style hanging. And you get a sense of what's happening in the in the art scene in Dublin very quickly or in Ireland by just going to to Hafton is quite amazing and we we support the artists by selling their their prints we have been lucky that uh, the office of public works OPW uh, who manages buildings around the country and amongst other things they have their own art collection that they use to decorate these buildings and they they purchase from Hafton so that means that people that are presented in Hafton enter the state collection oh cool that's really nice uh, yeah it's pretty cool and then we have some other events or some other projects that for example the how to flatten a mountain is a residency that we run in collaboration with cow house studios that usually is before the festival because the purpose of this residency is to create during 10 12 days somehow a body of work during that time or finalizing a body of work that is then presented in the festival uh, it's a pretty cool residency and uh, if uh, i would recommend anybody whether whether they want to uh, join the How to Flatten a Mountain Residency or not, to at least get to know Gao House Studios because it is a, an incredible place to develop your your artistic practice, you know, to f- go and focus. And uh, they do a, a type of short and long-term residencies. Oh, so is the residency through Gaul House, did you say? Cow, sorry, very well. It's my Spanish accent. Cow House Studios. Oh, Cow House, yeah. okay. So they run the residencies, but you guys do them. Is it a residency through Photo Island? It's a residency that Photo Island and Cow House Studios offer. And how long does it go for? The residency is run for 12 days. Oh, cool. Oh, it's only a short one. Yeah, because it's focused on... uh come to Ireland, get to work and exhibit. It has been working quite nicely over the last years. This year, uh, it had to be cancelled, unfortunately. The thing is that the, the residency, it was every year, but then we decided to, to run it every, every second year. So I don't know what will happen next year, but by now, the idea is that whoever was selected for the residency this year, they may enjoy the, the facilities in a different way. But yeah, it's, it is a very interesting residency that I recommend. And it is a very interesting place, Cowhouse Studios, that I completely recommend. And then we have this other project called New Iris Works, which is a triennial project. The first iteration was in 2013, then then 2016 and 2019. What uh, it involves is a selection of what in Europe is mostly called talents. We're trying to select a number of individuals based on their current projects. And the selection is made by invited professionals. So it's not just me and and my mates. Throughout those three years, they are promoted in different ways. So in the first New Iris Work, we had exhibitions in Dublin, seven exhibitions in Dublin, Cork and Limerick, and we published a book and the second iteration we made a book per artist and there were 20 artists and then we ran double exhibitions in the library projects every month there was uh, two artists in the library project and we will launch two two books so it's about kind of like making noise and, and repeating the names and showing you the work and again and again so you get to know it you know last year was um, the last edition of nearest works we we hosted in this space that we call the museum of contemporary photography of ireland which is a, a public facing project that we presented in dublin castle in a 2000 square meters conference type of space. So they they got that. And now we are planning to make a publication presenting the work of the 10 artists that were selected this year. So since I mentioned it, the Museum of Contemporary Photography of Ireland is a project that we started last year that is, is going to come back over the next years. You can call it a pop-up museum, but, but I would prefer to, to define it more as a, as a research project project that is actually facing the public. So when we arrived to this space, the print works, where we uh, were going to host the, the July elements of the festival, the ones that this critic never went to, we, you know, it quickly became apparent that this it has this kind of institutional layout. You know, you have your reception, you have your clock room, you have all these spaces. And we had this idea of uh, devising the future museum and kind of like fell into place that actually that space was going to be the, the Museum of Contemporary Photography of Ireland. It was going to be presented that way. And it kind of joined with the idea that we have for the patrons, the patrons that support us via patreon.com, our kind patrons. 
to who we gave these stickers that uh, made reference to the idea of a museum in, in Ireland. There was something, again, you know, this idea of uh, these floating ideas that may be hanging around for, for uh, quite a while until they materialize. Now, having done this first iteration, uh, we have learned a lot about that particular space and the Office of Public Works, who are the owners of that space or the people that manage it, they allow us to go back from 2022 to 2025. So we are programming some large scale, some very ambitious exhibition, starting with a massive survey on uh, photography in, in Ireland in 2022. So it will be presented again as a museum. And then from then, from that uh, inst installment, further than the years, the space is going to become more and more progressively experimental. We believe that, uh, you know, we should be more aligned with uh, digital technologies and we should be more aligned with interaction. And we, we, you know, there are different ways uh, of engaging with photography that perhaps artists and art galleries are doing far better than photographers and photography galleries. So we want to go into that route. You mentioned the Critical Academy. So we created this sort of like mental space more than physical that in short evaluates what we are doing, you know. Through the festival, we have always have been quite critical with what we do. So, you know, uh, we don't want to replicate the uh, relationships of power during portfolio reviews. So we come up with these critical practice reviews, which are meetings between three professionals and two photographers. So there is not going to be any sort of bullying or, um, and, and this uh, one of the professionals happens to be, and it has to be somebody coming from a design or advertising or marketing perspective so there is a sense that the you know, ideas are provided from a, a, a different angle we we always try to be critical and productive about these processes so the critical academy was again sort of like a materialization of um, of this idea that we have to create a space where we we deal with not only with us but also let's talk about the context let's talk about the arts council let's talk about the history or all that data that uh, this this uh, journal or this uh, news sheet or this publication has uh, released and let's talk how how have they engaged with photography over, over the last 10 years? What is missing? What is failing? We needed to have that sort of space. And um, and at the same time, we needed to look at education. So, you know, in, in the teaching of photography, there is a lot of things that have been missed. Perhaps there is a focus on the production more so at times and, you know, devising or underlining the importance of research skills or writing skills and how do you teach writing about your work and how do you teach research skills? How about business skills? Uh, you know, that cannot just be a module if if I'm going to be a, a sustainable artist, I need to know a lot about business. Oh, definitely. When I do short workshops here sometimes about artists working with photography, how they can enter the art market and how they can become more professional, you do need to think like a sole entrepreneur because you need to take care of all of that stuff. You need to learn about doing your accounts or finding an accountant, about marketing, about having a database, knowing where everything is. It seems when a lot of people come out of art school, they don't learn any of that. No. So, you know, this, this idea that the arts, you not know, just photography, it lives in a very specific space in the economy. And, and that can also be dangerous as much as rewarding, you know, for, for your practice. So the Critical Academy was also a space to provide this, this type of skills. We ran a number of seminars and we, we learned that, you know, we now we want to devise a one year program, sort of like a non-accredited master that uh, detoxifies you from what you have learned from uh, the university uh, and uh, focuses on things that are missing because obviously the, there are lots of really good things that you learn through university but uh, you know you need to remove that bubble and kind of like uh, go back to reality so we are working on that sort of master and we're trying to figure out uh, it's, it's a very complex thing to do while you are doing all the other things. So we're trying to figure out how to devise this. And by now that has materialized in, I think it's four to eight weeks seminars, but it also facilitated ideas. Okay. So when, when you get into this mindset, because I was telling you this, it is a mindset. It's not a physical space per se. We came up with the idea uh, eventually of cre uh, creating uh, the photo island wiki. So what is this? Well, you know, how can we tell how many practitioners are there if, if they are not accounted for? What's the quickest way to uh, account them for? Uh, well, you can start to Google IS photographers. There is no many repositories online, so let's create one. And, and if we create one that is going to feed into eventually Wikipedia, even better. So we started this process of uh, creating Photo Island Wiki, and that's kind of like a, at a very raw and early stage, but that's going to help us a lot to feed into, for example, the 2022 exhibition. So all the artists that are present in, in the Wiki now can be acknowledged in that, in that exhibition. It also allows us to, to reflect on things that, that we do because everything that we did started from the festival, but then the festival 
it's almost like we started the table from the leg and then we realized that actually the, the structure was a bit more complex. So what we used to call the library project collection became the photo iron collection. This simple thing that, you know, it may not change anybody's lives. It, it just helps a lot us to understand how, how we are uh, working. The library project was uh, the name that we give to, we gave to all the books in 2011 when we, we celebrated the first book and magazine fair. Mm, at a time where there has never been in Ireland uh, an Arab book fair. We ran this uh, book fair focused on photography and we had like over 600 publications from all around the world. The publishers that supported us were, were you know, very kind. And that's when we, we had Martin Parr and the book with Martin Parr and uh, the, many of the events uh, involved uh, Marcus Schaden and Bruno Sechel and many other, many other great individuals. I mean, quite an amazing program for that year. But the point is that, you know, when those books, when the festival finished and, and those books went back into boxes, they came to our office and I always joke that, you know, they were there in a corner crying and they were dying to be seen. Yeah. You know, the, these books are to be seen. They are nowhere else in Ireland. So this is our library project. We had to develop a, a library out of uh, these books and make it grow. So every year we kept adding and we tried to show these books uh, in all the iterations of the festival. And whenever we had a chance to travel to... Uh, to Riga or to travel to Melbourne, um, travel to whatever we were invited to by the wonderful people that invited us, we tried to bring the, the books. So when we finally, uh, in 2013, were invited to show these books in Temple Bar for a month residency, we had this hyper-specialized photo book library in Dublin, in, in front of the headquarters of the tourism in Ireland, which is the Temple Bar bar. It was, I mean, quite a, uh, an unusual thing, but actually people loved it and people wanted to buy the books. and. Very quickly, we kind of realized, actually, maybe, you know, this month's residency could become a, a tenancy, you know, and uh, they were actually looking for tenants. So we we changed that. We we uh, did a lot of research and we spoke with everybody and eventually we put a proposal and we became tenants. And suddenly another hurdle became how to run a bookshop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's not get into just the sheer deal of the software, but the accountancy and the, you know, the organization and the display. And the, so let's do it. So we opened the bookshop and over time, the library project, then kind of like people passing by looking, the library project, the library project. We had to put underneath books, magazines, and fanzines because other people didn't, wouldn't understand what is the library project. And now eventually that turned into a... Uh, for visual culture and critical thinking. <laughs> uh, but the library project has become kind of an Ireland's art bookshop. It's a hyper-specialized uh, art bookshop. And it, it hosts the Photo Ireland collection. So the name of the collection, which was those those books uh, in boxes, now is the Photo Ireland collection. And the library project now has become that physical space. So it's interesting how these things can shift. And, uh, and perhaps, you know, the, the, the last one, just to, to go through that tour of uh, the project, something that came out of the Critical Academy was over, you know. It is through, through many conversations that over has materialized in the way that it has materialized materialize, you know, and not in the in the way image based in 2010 will have materialized. So it's it, you know, I think it is a bit a bit more interesting and a bit more sharp around the ages. Those are the, the projects that that we ran in, in short, you know, we 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 publish as well. We started a collection that we call the TLP editions, TLP for the library project. And these are like inexpensive fun scenes, sort of like 36 pages long. They represent what's happening. It is what we intend to do, to have a wide selection of practices. Some are more serious than others, but, you know, they're, they're all slowly building up to a collection of around 30 to date. We don't have uh, funds, we don't have a lot of money, but we have to be resourceful. But, you know, these TLP editions are, are a good example of how with uh, your time and um, and with a bit of creativity, you can actually come up with an interesting project, you know, building over time into something meaningful. We have had two postcard projects because we are in Temple Bar and we are in, in the main tourist fair in, in Dublin. We have made a particular collection that was focused to the tourist trade. So it's called Greetings from Ireland. So whoever sees these uh, beautiful pictures of Ireland, they will appreciate them as, as like vistas, you know. But actually these pictures are all by uh, local artists and they are, in many in many cases they represent deadpan views of Ireland. For example, there is a picture of a crossroad in a small village and there is absolutely nothing happening. There's a picture of the, the back of a ship, and, you know, because it has been painted with green. And, you know, it's quite sort of like a funny approach. So instead of having the wonderful vista of the cliffs of her it's actually some friends having fun in the cliffs of Moher. you know so it's more about that everyday life and that worked that worked out really well and uh, it was exhibited a, a number of times uh, and then this year just before the lockdown we launched uh, 100 views of contemporary ireland we kind of expand on that idea but in this case it's about uh, focusing on 100 photographers that are active are based in ireland and so we made this collection of 100 postcards i mean who buys 100 postcards well you know many people actually it turns out uh, and we did an installation in the library project and uh, you had to be closed, unfortunately, but that was part of the St. Patrick's Festival this year. 
it's really inspiring actually listening to all the things that you've created out of this initial contact with Moritz in Switzerland. And now all of a sudden, it's not just a festival, but you've created a hub in Ireland, in Dublin, and now there's a magazine. It's definitely, I think, for anybody else that's thinking, oh, I'm only one person, I can't make a change and do something. Like you've made a huge contribution really to the photographic community in Ireland and probably throughout Europe and parts of the world that have experienced or come into contact with photography as a result of the festival. And hopefully, through the journal and particularly the online aspect, it gets a lot more engagement. Yeah, I think this has been quite organic in terms of the process, you know, like this idea of the building the table with uh, starting with a leg. In, in a way, it's sort of like addressing a number of issues along the way and because you're critical. Like, I never wanted to start a festival, you know, I just wanted to finish my degree and become an artist, you know, but I had to deal with some stuff before that. At least I'm being cre- creative along the way. That's perfectly fine. You know, I put all my endeavors into producing these things that I hope others enjoy. And all the things that we have done, you know, all these projects that we mentioned, there is a sense of inclusiveness and to try to show what is there and not specifically what I think is right or what I personally like. Because there is a big difference on that in 2010. Not only the festival started, but also there was a supermassive black hole and online magazine run by uh, Barry W. Hughes. Blow Photo Magazine started then. And, you know, there was a couple of things started in, in Ireland and it was because the gates that were there to allow us to, to continue, they were, they were closed. You know, there was uh, this, somebody was holding the door from behind and it was like, uh, I mean, I believe that I'm the product of these circumstances or this situation, you know, where the demand was growing and it was known, but the supply was very poor. And also at a time where, you know, the, the internet has been on for over a decade, people are aware of practices from all, all around the world for disinformed individuals to be told by some local that this or that is the dog's bollocks, if you excuse my French. I think he may very quickly realize other individuals that this needed to change. So it's not just me, but then, you know, that kind of process. And again, I'm telling you, like, I'd love for anybody to come, please set up a festival and so I can still do it. Please set up a new magazine so I had to stop this one. <laughs> uh, set up a, a new art bookshop so I had to close mine. There's an opportunity there. If somebody said like, no, there's no jobs. Yes, there are lots of jobs. You know, there's lots of jobs uh, that you can make for yourself if you want and still developing your your practice. For us, one of the key components in this process of evolution has been when we reached out to Europe, you know, when the festival, again, thanks to Moritz, you know, when I started to visit different festival, invited to, to do portfolio reviews and to network, and suddenly that turned into a collaboration through Creative Europe, European Union project funded. In the first one that, that we were invited to participate was called the Flaner, with this one based association called Procurarte, fantastic team. They trusted us. Us. Europe is trusting us. Europe is appreciating us. Then we are invited to join Futures Platform, the Parallel Platform. Mm-hmm. So there's a sense that, you know, what we're doing at times, it may be more appreciated within Europe than locally, or at least the rewards of, of, of engaging with Europe are quite high. And actually that's paying back locally as well, you know, so we are we are able to promote the work of, of uh, for example, today, there's like 30 photographers being promoted through the European platforms uh, around Europe that include maybe some exhibitions or the inclusions of, on, on certain publications, aside from, you know, sort of like keeping them active in their practice and contributing to the development of their career and their network. So uh, for us, Europe it has been an, an essential part of our growth. And now we are at a point where we are potentially going to lead a uh, European Union project and things are going to become a bit more serious on the sense. I think, uh, you know, uh, perhaps in a, in a moment, you know, post-Brexit where people were considering whether Europe is valuable or not, I think we are incredibly lucky to have something called a European Union that, you know, that gives us support, never mind for all the other aspects of our life, but, you know, in the arts and culture. So I would say high five and thank you to everybody in Europe <laughs> and all, all, the, all the partners and all the people that have contributed to us. And I'd like to take a moment to thank my mom and my dad uh, <laughs> and perhaps everybody that, that supported the, the Indiegogo campaign, all the patrons from Photo Ireland and all the organizations. It is uh, uh, incredible that you have all these people uh, supporting your, your practice. You know, it's, it's quite rewarding. There's like hundreds of uh, people every year supporting the festival. Many individuals that even return the, uh, a year later yeah. <laughs> to keep supporting and, and working uh, with us. So it's super exciting. It's a great time to be alive. I hope you enjoyed hearing the insights from Angel and has inspired you to take risks in your chosen creative pursuit. I'll include links in the show notes to the topics we spoke about today. However, I want to highlight that you can order your copy of Overjournal from the dedicated website, overjournal.org. And if you'd like to submit work to future editions of the publication, then just visit overjournal.org slash submissions 
And although we have no idea what next month will look like, let alone next year, the Photo Island team have already started working on the 2021 edition of the festival. So if you'd like to be involved, there are opportunities for art professionals listed on the website, photoisland.org forward slash opportunities forward slash four dash individuals. As I mentioned, each of these links will be listed in the show notes together with the related social media so you can keep up to date. Subtext and Discourse is streaming on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and more. Please subscribe to keep up to date and share the podcast with your like-minded friends. As always, I welcome any comments, questions, or feedback about this or previous episodes, so don't be afraid to get in touch. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name's Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.